The Sixth Sermon, Justification by Faith That the faithful are justified by faith, without the law and works. Being ready here, dearly beloved, to speak to you of faith, which without works justifies those who believe, I call upon the Father, who is in heaven, through his only begotten Son Jesus Christ our Lord, beseeching him to open my mouth and lips to set forth his praise, and to illuminate your hearts. That you, acknowledging the great benefit of God, may become thankful for it, and holy indeed. First of all, I will say certain things that are chiefly necessary to this argument or treatise, touching this term justification. The term justifying, very usual and common among the Hebrews, and having a large signification, is not so well understood by all men today, as it ought to be. To justify is the same as saying, to acquit from judgment and from the pronounced and uttered sentence of condemnation. It signifies to remit offenses, to cleanse, to sanctify, and to give an inheritance of life everlasting. For it is a term of law belonging to courts, where judgment is exercised. Imagine therefore, that man is set before the judgment seat of God, and that man is plead guilty there. Namely, he is accused and convicted of heinous offenses, and therefore he is sued to punishment or to the sentence of condemnation. Imagine also that the Son of God makes intercession and comes in as a mediator, desiring that the whole fault and punishment due to us may be laid upon him that by his death he may cleanse them and take these away, setting us free from death and giving us life everlasting. Imagine too that God, the Most High and Just Judge, receives the offer and translates the punishment, together with the fault, from us to the neck of his Son. Along with this, he makes a statute, that whoever believes that the Son of God suffered for the sins of the world, broke the power of death, and delivered us from damnation, should be cleansed from his sins and made an heir of life everlasting. Who, therefore, can be so dull of understanding? that he may not perceive that mankind is justified by faith. But that there may be no cause for doubt or darkness left in the mind of any man, what I have already said generally, by the parable and similitude fetched from our common law, I will here particularly bring into certain parts. Confirming and manifestly proving every one of them severally out of the holy scriptures, so that even to the slowest wits, the power of faith and the work of justification may be most evident. And first, I will show you that this term justification is taken in this present treatise for the absolution and remission of sins, for sanctification, and adoption into the number of the sons of God. In the thirteenth chapter of the Acts, the Apostle Paul says, Be it known to you, men and brethren, that through this Lord Jesus Christ is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him. All who believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts 13 38 and 39. See, in Christ the forgiveness of sins is preached to us, and he that believes that Christ preached forgives sins is also justified. It follows therefore that justification is the remission of sins. In the fifth chapter to the Romans, the same apostle says, being justified by the blood of Christ, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 5 9. But the blood of Christ washes away sins. Justification, therefore, is the washing away or forgiveness of sins. And again, in the same chapter, he says more plainly judgment entered by one offense unto condemnation, but the gift of many sins unto justification. Romans 5.16 He makes justification the contrary to condemnation, therefore, justification is the absolution and delivery from condemnation. What do you say to this, moreover, that he plainly calls justification a gift, that is, the forgiveness of sins? To this also belong these words of his, even as by the sin of one, condemnation came upon all men, so by the righteousness of one, good came upon all men to the justification of life. Romans 5.18 
Here again, the justification of life is made the contrary of condemnation unto death, set as a pain upon our heads because of the transgression. Justification of life is therefore an absolution from sins, a delivery from death, a quickening or translating from death to life. For in the fourth chapter to the Romans, the Apostle expounds justification by sanctification, and sanctification by the remission of sins. For in treating faith, by which we are justified, or which God imputes to us for righteousness without works, he says, even as David also expounds the blessedness of that man to whom the Lord imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Romans 4 7. What could be more plainly spoken than this? For he evidently expounds justification by sanctification, and sanctification by remission of sins. Furthermore, what else is sanctification but the adoption by which we are received into the grace and number of the sons of God? What is he, therefore, who does not see that in this treatise of St. Paul, justification is taken for adoption? Especially since in the very same fourth chapter to the Romans, he goes about proving that an inheritance is due to faith, to which he also attributes justification. By all this, it is made manifest that the question of justification contains nothing else but the manner and reason of sanctification, that is to say, by which and how men have their sins forgiven and are received into the grace and number of the sons of God in being justified, are made heirs of the kingdom of God. And now, let us test whether what we have said is taught in the scriptures, that Christ before the judgment seat of God, when sentence of condemnation was to be pronounced against us for our offenses, took our sins upon his own neck, and purged them by the sacrifice of his death upon the cross, and that God also laid upon Christ our fault and punishment, so that Christ alone is the only satisfaction and purging of the faithful. The Apostle Paul teaches this most expressly, where he says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who shall condemn? It is Christ who died, indeed, rather it is he who is raised up, and is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Romans 8 33 and 34. And again he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, while he was made the curse for us, for it is written, Cursed be every one who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, etc. Galatians 3 13 and 14. The apostle taught this out of the writings of Moses. And Moses in his books often mentions that the sins are laid upon the heads of the beasts which were sacrificed. But those sacrifices bore the type or figure of the death and sacrifice of Christ. Isaiah also expressly says in his 53rd chapter, He truly has taken on himself our infirmities and borne our pains. He was wounded for our iniquities and struck for our sins. For the pain of our punishment was laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We all went astray like sheep, every one turned his own way, but the Lord has thrown upon him all our sins. And immediately after, he has taken away the sins of the multitude, and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53 4 6, 12. I think nothing more can be brought to the matter, or is more fit for our present purpose than these words. St. Peter alludes to this when he says, The Lord himself bore our sins in his body upon the cross, that we, being dead to sin, may live to righteousness, by the sign of whose stripes we are made whole. 1 Peter 2.24 St. John the Baptist, forerunner of the Lord, alluded to this when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. John 1.29 Moreover, the Apostle Paul bears witness to this, saying, Him that did not know sin, he made sin for us, that through him we might be made the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Also in his epistle to the Colossians he says, It pleased the Father, 
that in Christ all fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, having set peace by him through the blood of his cross, both things on earth and things in heaven. Colossians 1 19 and 20. These testimonies, I suppose, are sufficiently evident to prove that our sins are laid upon Christ, with the curse or condemnation due to our offenses, and that by his blood Christ has cleansed our sins, and by his death he has vanquished death and the devil, the author of death, and taken away the punishment due to us. Yet, because there are some, and those are not a few, who deny that by his death, Christ has taken both fault and punishment from us sinners, and that he became the only satisfaction of the whole world, I will therefore now allege certain other testimonies, and repeat something of what I recited before, to thereby make it manifest that Christ, the only satisfaction of the world, has made satisfaction both for our fault and for our punishment. Isaiah witnessed truly, that both the fault of our offense and the punishment were taken away, when he says, he bore our infirmities, and was wounded for our iniquities. Finally, the discipline of peace was laid on him, that is, the discipline, or chastising, or punishment. Bringing peace, or the penalty of our correction, that is, the punishment due to us for our offenses. Also mark what follows, and with the blueness of his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 4 and 5. This evidently teaches that our punishment is taken away by the pain of Christ. For look what pain, penalty, punishment, or correction was due to us, and that was laid on the Lord himself. And for that reason, the Lord was wounded and received stripes, and with them he healed us. But he would not have healed us at all if we were yet to look for wounds, stripes, and strokes that is to say, punishment for our sins. The death of Christ, therefore, is a full satisfaction for our sins. But I ask you, what would Christ avail us, if we were still to be punished for our offenses? Therefore, when we say that he bore all our sins in his body upon the cross, what else do we mean, I ask you, if not that the Lord, by a death that was not due him, took God's vengeance from us, that it might not light on us to our punishment? Paul, as often as he mentions our redemption made by Christ, calls it antilutron for us. He does not understand this word as the common sort do, as barely and simply redemption, but as the very price and satisfaction of redemption. This is why he also writes that Christ himself gave himself to be the antilutron for us that is to say, the price with which captives are redeemed from their enemies in the war. For what we commonly call ransoms, the Greeks call lutra. So then, antilutron is when a man is redeemed for a man, and a life is redeemed for a life. But no punishment is afterward laid upon those who are thus ransomed and set at liberty, because of the translation of it from one to another. Furthermore, this is the new covenant that God in his Christ has made with us, that he will not remember our iniquities. Hebrews 8:12. But how could he choose not to remember our iniquities, if he did not also cease to punish them? So then, this is not to be doubted, that Christ our Lord is the full propitiation, satisfaction, oblation, and sacrifice for the sins I say, for the punishment and the fault of the whole world, yes. And by himself alone, for there is salvation in no other nor is there any other name given to men by which they must be saved. Acts 4.12 I do not deny that because of discipline, chastisement, and exercise, diverse sorts of punishments are laid on men's necks, and that they are diversely afflicted and vexed because of their offenses. But those afflictions however they may be patiently suffered by the faithful, do not yet wash sins away, nor make satisfaction for misdeeds. St. Peter says, Do not marvel that you are tried by fire, which is done for your trial, as if anything new were happening to you, yes, rather rejoice in this, that you are partakers of the afflictions of Christ, so that in the revelation of his glory, you also may rejoice and be glad. 1 Peter 4 12 and 13. This, I say, is the end and use of afflictions.
And by this means, the glory of Christ endures pure and uncorrupted. It now remains for me to prove out of the Holy Scriptures that God the Father has ordained that whoever believes in the only begotten Son of God will be made partaker of Christ's righteousness, that is, he will be justified by him, be absolved from his sins, and be made heir of life everlasting. Isaiah therefore says, in acknowledging him, or in his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify the multitude, whose sins he himself shall bear. But what else is the acknowledging or knowledge of Christ, if not true faith? Moreover, the Lord Jesus himself says in the Gospel of St. John, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 14 and 15 There was no other remedy in the desert, against the envenomed bitings of the serpents, except the contemplation or beholding of the serpent lifted up and hung aloft. No plaster cured those who were poisoned wisdom 1612 no oblation made to God, not prayer itself offered to God, not any work, nor any other way. Only beholding the serpent made the poison harmless that had then crept into all their limbs. In like manner, nothing at all saves us from death except faith in Christ. For by faith we behold and see Christ lifted up upon the stake of the cross, as seen in the sixth chapter of John. The Words of Our Savior It follows in God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes should not perish, but have life everlasting. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already, because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3 16-18 by these words, now the third time, faith is beaten into our heads, by which we are made partakers of the Son of God, of his life, salvation, redemption, and all good things beside. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to John, our Lord again says, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that every one who sees the Son, and believes in him, should have life everlasting, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6:40. Nothing can be alleged to make more for our present argument than these words of his. For he says plainly that the will of God the Father is that we should believe in the Son, and by this belief we have our salvation. Upon this, John the Evangelist and Apostle, in his canonical epistle, dares to burst forth in these words. He that does not believe God makes him a liar, because he did not believe the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. 1 John 5 10-12 Dearly beloved, note this, the eternal and unchangeable will of God is that he will give eternal life to the world. But he will give that life through Christ, who is naturally life itself, and can give life. The very same God also wills that we obtain and have life in us, and that we have it no other way than by faith. For the Apostle Paul taught that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Ephesians 3:17. Moreover, the Lord himself also witnesses, and says, He that eats me shall live by me. John 6:57. But you know, dearly beloved, that to eat Christ is to believe in him. And therefore, we knit up this place with these words of St. Peter, All the prophets bear witness to this Christ, that whoever believes in him shall receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Acts 10.43 We have in these a most ample testimony of the whole sacred scriptures. By these I have evidently enough declared what God has appointed, that whoever believes in Christ, being cleansed from his sins, shall be made heir of life everlasting. I will make this more evident yet, by declaring how faith alone that is, faith for itself, and not for any works of ours justifies the faithful.
For itself I say, not that it respects a quality of the mind in us, or our own work in ourselves, but in respect to that faith which is the gift of God's grace, having in it a promise of righteousness and life, and in respect that faith, naturally, of itself. It is a certain and undoubted persuasion resting upon God, and believing that God, being pacified by Christ, has bestowed life and all good things on us through Christ. Therefore, faith in Christ justifies, by the grace and promise of God. And so faith justifies that is, that which we believe, and in which our confidence is settled, God himself, I say, by the grace of God, justifies us through our redemption in Christ, so that now, our own works or merits have no place left to them at all I mean, in justification. Otherwise, good works do have their place in the faithful, as we mean to show in a convenient place. For Paul, the teacher of the Gentiles, by way of opposition, compares Christ with Adam, and shows that of Adam, and so of our own nature and strength, we have nothing but sin, the wrath of God, and death. And he shows this under the name of Adam, with the intent that no man should seek righteousness and life in the flesh. And again, on the other side, he declares that by Christ we have righteousness, the grace of God, life, and the forgiveness of all our sins. In this opposition, he earnestly urges and often repeats this word, of 1, Romans 5 12, Truly, this is to no other end, but that we should understand that faith alone justifies. To the Galatians he very evidently uses this kind of argument. Nobody adds to or takes anything away from the last will and testament of a man, once it is proved. Galatians 3.15 Reason therefore rightly requires that no man add anything to, or take anything away from, the testament of God. But this is the testament which God confirmed, that his will is to bestow the blessing upon Abraham's seed, not in many, or by many, but through one. For he does not say, and to the seeds, as though he spoke of many, but as speaking of one he says, and to your seed, that is, Christ. Galatians 3.16 Therefore, it is a detestable thing to augment or diminish anything in this testament of God. Christ alone is the only Savior still. Men can neither save themselves nor others. Again, in the same epistle to the Galatians he says, We know that man is not justified by the works or the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, insomuch as no flesh shall be justified by the works of the law. Galatians 2.16 This is now the third time that Paul says that men are not justified by the works of the law, in which clause he comprehends all manner of works of whatever sort. So then, no kind of works justify. But what is it then that justifies? Faith in Christ, and truly that alone. For what else can those words import? We know that man is not justified but by faith in Christ. For the force of these two statements is the same, faith alone justifies, and it is certain that we are not justified but by faith in Jesus Christ. He adds the example of the apostles, and we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, and not by the works of the law. In like manner also, Peter argues by an example in the Acts of the Apostles, and says, We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they were. Acts 15:11. Moreover, in the very same chapter to the Galatians he says, I do not despise the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians 2:21. For, if we in ourselves had anything by which we might be saved, why did the Son of God need to take on our flesh, to suffer, and to die? But because the Son of God, being incarnate, suffered and died, and did not die in vain, there was therefore nothing in our flesh that could obtain salvation for mankind. This is why the only Son of God is our Savior forever, and by true faith, He makes us partakers of His salvation. Paul, in the very beginning of his epistle to the Romans, proves that all men are sinners, 
that in men there remains no strength for them to be saved by, and that the law of God itself digs up the knowledge of offenses, that is, it applies them, brings them to light, and makes them manifest. But it does not take them away, blot them out, or utterly extinguish them. And therefore God, for his own goodness sake, to the end that the work that he has made would not altogether perish, justifies the faithful freely by faith in Jesus Christ. I will repeat a few of the Apostle's own words. The righteousness of God is declared without the law, being witnessed by the law, and the prophets notwithstanding. The righteousness of God, I say, comes by faith in Jesus Christ to all and upon all those who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned, and need the glory of God, but are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Romans 3.21-25 These words of the Apostle, I suppose, are most manifest to those who believe. He plucks justification from our own merits and strength, and attributes it to grace, by which the Son of God is given to the world for the punishment of the cross that all those who believe that they are redeemed by the blood of the Son of God may be justified. Again the Apostle immediately after adds, Therefore we hold that man is justified by faith without the works of the law. On the heel of this, he again argues thus, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, even of the Gentiles also. For it is one God who justifies circumcision by faith, and uncircumcision through faith. Romans 5 28-30 To be God, is nothing else than to be life and salvation. But God is the God of the Gentiles also, and not of the Jews alone. Therefore God is the life and salvation of the Gentiles. He communicates this life and salvation to us, not by the law or through circumcision, but by faith in Christ, therefore faith alone justifies. This may be proved by the example of Cornelius the centurion who, as soon as St. Peter had preached to him, and once he believed, he was later justified, when as yet he had not received circumcision or the law when as yet he had not sacrificed, nor merited righteousness by any work that he did. For he was freely justified in faith through Jesus Christ. For Peter concluded his sermon to him in these words, All the prophets give witness to this Christ, that through his name whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10.43 After all this, the Apostle Paul brings forth that notable and singular example of our father Abraham, teaching by what means our father Abraham was justified. For once this was truly declared, it cannot help but be plain and manifest to everyone by what means God's will is to justify all men. For the sons cannot be justified any other way than the father before them was justified. Abraham, therefore, was not justified by circumcision, or by receiving the sacrament, for it is said that he was justified before he was circumcised. Afterward, the sign of circumcision was added as the seal of the righteousness of faith that is, the sign or sealing that all the seed of Abraham is justified by faith. Romans 4 10-12 The same Abraham, our father, was not justified by the law. For the law was 430 years after the promise Galatians 3.17 not to take away sin or to work justification, but to make sin apparent, and to make us altogether empty, and once we are made empty, to send and as it were, compel us to fly to Christ. Again, Abraham was not justified by his works. And yet, good works are to be found in that most excellent patriarch, yes, and those are good works of true faith too which are both notable and many in number, such and so many as you will scarcely find in any other. Nevertheless, the Apostle says, What then shall we say Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, who I say, is our father according to the flesh, has merited or found? For the Greek word hurakini has both those significations. 
For if Abraham were justified by works, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. Romans 4 1 and 2 For God alone is just, and he alone justifies. All men are corrupt, indeed, even Abraham is a sinner, and every man stands in need of the glory of God. For this cause also, the prophet was plainly forbidden to boast in anything, but in the mercy of God. This is why Abraham did not boast against God. He acknowledged that he was a sinner, and was to be justified freely, and not for his own merit's sake. The apostle goes on to say, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Romans 4 3 Two things are affirmed here, first, that Abraham believed in God, and secondly, that this was imputed to him for righteousness. By this it follows that Abraham was justified by faith, and not by works. And the apostle proves that in this manner, righteousness is not imputed to him who merits righteousness by works. But righteousness is imputed to Abraham. Therefore he did not merit righteousness by works. Again, truly, to him who does not work but believes, his faith is counted for righteousness. Abraham believed in God, therefore his faith was reckoned for righteousness. Romans 4 1-5 In the same chapter, the same apostle brings forth other arguments, altogether as strong as these, to prove that faith justifies without works. If those, he says, who are of the law are heirs, then faith is but vain, and the promise is made of no effect. Romans 4.14 Those are of the law, who seek to be justified by the works of the law. But faith rests upon the mercy of God. What place then shall grace and the mercy of God have left to them, if we merit justification by works? Why should I need to believe that I will be justified by the blood of Christ, if God is one with me again by my works the one who was angry with me for my sins? Finally, salvation and righteousness are promised by God. But then the promise ends when our own merits begin to take its place. For the apostle says to the Galatians, If inheritance is of the law, then it is not now of the promise. But God gave the inheritance to Abraham by promise. Galatians 3.18.22 Therefore, that the promise might remain stable, faith justifies and not merits. Again, in the fourth chapter to the Romans he says, Therefore the inheritance is given by faith, that it might be by grace, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Romans 4.16 He repeats here two causes for which he attributes justification to faith and not to works. The first is that justification may be a free gift and that the grace of God may be praised. The second is that the promise and salvation may remain steadfast and that it may come upon the Gentiles also. But it would not be given to the Gentiles if it were due only to the law and circumcision because the Gentiles lack them both. Finally, the hope of our salvation ought to be steadfastly established. But it would never be surely grounded, or safely preserved, if it were attributed to our own works or merits, for something is always lacking in them. But nothing can be lacking in God and in the merit of the Son of God. Therefore, our salvation is surely confirmed, it is not to be doubted, and it is assuredly certain, if we seek it by faith in the Son of God, who is our righteousness and salvation. To all these I will add yet another testimony out of St. Paul, which indeed is both very evident and easily perceived. In his epistle to the Ephesians he says, By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast in himself. For we are the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained before, that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 8-10
I will not say more than this, nor will I expound the words of Paul at large. For these testimonies are clearer than the noonday, and most evidently testify that we are justified by faith, and not by any works. But, reverend brethren in the Lord, good works come into no jeopardy here, so as to set little by them because this doctrine teaches that faith alone justifies. This is what the apostles of Christ taught, why then should we not teach it too? As for those who think this doctrine by which we constantly affirm that faith alone without works justifies, is contrary to religion, let them blame the apostles of Christ, and not find fault with us. Moreover, although we say that the faithful are justified by faith alone, or by faith without works, we do not say, as many think we do, that faith is posted alone, or is utterly destitute of good works. For wherever there is faith, there it also shows itself by good works, because the righteous cannot help but work righteousness. But before he works righteousness that is to say, good works he must of necessity be righteous. Therefore the righteous man does not attain righteousness, which goes before, by works that follow after. This is why righteousness is attributed to grace. For by grace, the faithful are freely justified in faith, according to that saying, the just shall live by his faith, Habakkuk 2.4, and after they are justified, they begin to bring forth the works of righteousness. Therefore, in this discourse I do not mean to overthrow good works, which have their due place and dignity in the church among the faithful before the face of God. But my mind is that I may by all means prove that the grace of God, and the merit of the Son of God, is overthrown and trodden underfoot, when we join our merits and works to the merit of Christ, and to faith, by which we take hold on Christ. For what can be more manifest than this saying of the blessed apostle, If we are saved by grace, then it is not now works, for then grace is no longer grace. But if we are saved by works, then it is not now grace, for the work is no longer work. Romans 11 6 This is why these two, grace and merit, or work, cannot stand together. Therefore, lest we overthrow the grace of God and wickedly deny the fruit of Christ's passion, we attribute justification to faith alone, because faith attributes it to the mere grace of God and the death of the Son of God. And yet for all this, we acknowledge that we are created, according to the doctrine of Paul, for good works for those good works, I say, which God ordained beforehand, Ephesians 2.10, which he has appointed in his word and requires us to walk in. Even though we walk in and have become rich in good works, notwithstanding that, we do not attribute our justification to them. But according to the doctrine of the gospel, we humble ourselves under the hand of him who says, So you also, when you have done all the things that have been commanded of you, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done no more than we ought to do. Luke 17.10 so then, as often as the godly read that our own works justify us, that our own works are called righteousness, that a reward in life everlasting are given for our own works he does not by and by swell with pride, nor forget the merit of Christ. But setting a godly and apt interpretation on such places, he considers that all things are by the grace of God, and that such great things are attributed to the works of men, because they are received into grace, and have now become the sons of God for Christ's sake. So that, in the end, all things may be turned upon Christ himself, for whose sake the godly know that they and all theirs are in favor and accepted by God the Father. In what I have said, I have declared to you, dearly beloved, the great effect of faith that is to say, that it justifies the faithful, this is little indeed in respect to the largeness of the matter, but it is sufficiently long in respect to the one hour space appointed me to speak in. Here, by the way, I have briefly touched, rather than at large discoursed upon, the whole work of justification, both profitable and necessary for all men to know. Now, therefore, I pass over this and come to the rest. True faith is the wellspring and root of all virtues and good works. First of all, it satisfies the mind and desire of man, 
and it makes him quiet and joyful. For the Lord in the Gospel says, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall not hunger, and he that believes in me shall not thirst at any time. John 6 35. For what more can he desire, who already feels that by true faith he possesses the very Son of God, in whom are found all the heavenly treasures, and in whom is all fullness and grace? Our consciences are made clear and quiet as soon as we perceive that by true faith, Christ the Son of God is altogether ours, that he has appeased the Father in our behalf, that he now stands in the presence of the Father, and makes intercession to him for us. And for that cause Paul says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 1 Through this Christ, by faith, we also have free passage to the Father. Ephesians 2.18 This is why we pray to the Father in His Son's name, and from His hand we obtain all things that are available to our benefit. Therefore, the Apostle John said very well, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we also know that we have the petitions that we requested from his hands. 1 John 5 14 and 15 Those who lack faith neither pray to God, nor receive from him the things that are for their welfare. Moreover, faith makes us acceptable to God, and it commands us to have an eye to using God's good gifts well. Faith causes us not to faint in tribulations. Indeed also, by faith we overcome the world, the flesh, the devil, and all adversities. As the Apostle John says, For all who are born of God overcome the world, and this is the victory that vanquishes the world, even your faith. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 1 John 5 4 and 5 Paul says, Some were racked, not caring, by faith to be set at liberty, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others were tried with mocks and stripes, with fetters and imprisonments, some were stoned, hewn in pieces, slain with the edge of the sword. They wandered in sheepskins and goat skins, comfortless, oppressed, afflicted, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains, and in the dens and caves of the earth. Hebrews 11:35-38. For the Lord himself said in the gospel, This I spoke to you, that you might have peace in me. In the world you have affliction, but be of good confidence, I have overcome the world. John 16 33 Faith therefore shall be, and is, both the force and strength of patience. Patience is the prop, uplifting, and preservation of hope. From faith Springs charity Charity is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13.10, which contains in it the sum of all good works. But unless we have a true faith in God, there is no charity in us. Everyone who loves him that begot, says John the Apostle, also loves him who was born of him. 1 John 5.1 The hour has passed a good while since, and no man is able in many hours, so substantially as it requires to declare the whole effect of faith. You have heard, dearly beloved, that true faith is the justification of the church, or of the faithful of God. It is, I say, the forgiveness of all sins, being received into the grace of God, being taken by adoption into the number of the sons of God, an assured and blessed sanctification, and finally, the wellspring of all good works. Let us, therefore, pray to God the Father in true faith, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he will grant to fill our hearts with this true faith, that in this present world, being joined to him in faith, we may serve him as we should, and that after our departure out of this life, we may forever live with him in whom we believe. To him be praise and glory forever. Amen.